We've been in a journey that we're calling it Joseph from tragedy to triumph. Joseph from tragedy to triumph. Because that, in essence, is everyone's story here. One way or another, we've all experienced brokenness. Uh, we've all experienced a chaos. Most of us, if not all of us, come from families that are broken or that were highly dysfunctional, if not somewhat dysfunctional. If you're, if you're fortunate, you come from a somewhat dysfunctional family where maybe things were not perfect, but you know that at least you had a decent parent or decent parents and grandparents. Uh, possibly you grew up in a, an environment that was healthy, and I pray that that's the case. But that's not the truth or the case for most of us. Most of us came from families that were broken, um, sin ravaged by sin. Um, there is the stain of past generational curses and generational sin, divorce rates that were rampant, alcoholism, incest, and you name it, uh, where there was vitriol, constant yelling, screaming, uh, physical abuse, mental abuse, psychological abuse, um, sexual abuse, where somewhere, some of us or grew up in a, an environment where there was uh, sexual exploitation, and then you have to grow up with that stain and, and the pain of being sexually abused. That's the reality of a fallen world, and that's the reality that most of us deal with because we ourselves are fallen in our nature. We have a fallen nature, and so we have to come to terms with that reality. So you can't become a scandalized. You can't say, woe is me. You can't not live as a victim. You might have been victimized, but you can't stay there. You have to um, see God's grace and God's favor upon in every one of these areas that is really a test for your life. It really is um, uh, an opportunity for you to trust God and to rise up and you basically rise above the level of the fray and the brokenness and the fracas of our past. And I'd like to use Joseph. Last week, uh, we, we talked about Joseph. Um, the, the, today, we're going to about t testing, the, the testing that Joseph uh, went through uh, in his life, uh, the testing. That ultimately, everything he went through, when he received a vision and a dream from God, it, it turned into a nightmare. Whatever he dreamed, and he dreamt from God dreams, and I'm going to share it real quickly it really turned into a nightmare where there was disparity. There was a total disconnect between what he dreamed and what he felt God wanted him to do with the reality on the ground. And he could have despaired. He could have just given up, um, throwing in the towel, but he didn't as an example to us. Let me just share with you, for example, that Joseph, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 37, that Joseph had a dream. And when he told the dream to his brothers, they hated him the more. And he said to them, listen, uh, to this dream I had. Um, and um, we were binding sheaves uh, of grain out in the field, and suddenly my sheaf arose of grain, uh, the wheat, if you will, and stood up straight while your sheaves gathered around mine. Just picture this, and they bowed down to it. And the brothers, see, Joseph is not telling them the interpretation, but the brothers get it immediately. And the brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Uh, will you actually rule over us? Uh, and they hated him all the more because of the dream and what he had said to them. Then he had another dream. And this dream was different. The first one had to do with the ground and the harvest. And the other dream had to do with heaven and the stars and the moon and the sun and he said, listen to this dream. I had another dream. At this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars uh, were bowing down to me. Now, he had 11 brothers. I wonder who the 11 stars represented. Huh. So the brothers are immediately getting the connection. They're, they're, they're making the nexus between the dream and the implications, and they're resenting it deeply but Joseph was just communicating his dream. Whether that was wise or not, and a lot of times it's probably unwise to just um, articulate verbally to people that don't love you, don't know you, or people that won't support your dream, your calling, your ministry. Sometimes it is antithetical. Sometimes it's just the wrong person, the wrong audience to be sharing your dreams. I believe in sharing dreams. I believe that dreams or visions uh, come from God or a plan comes from God. But I think that there's wisdom here that God calls us, all of us, to have wisdom on how we communicate and who do we share it with. 
And so last week, I just want to do a quick review. Last week, we talked about that God make, made no perfect families. That God made no perfect families. Last week, let me see here. Yep. Um, um, God made no perfect families. That God's plans for our lives sometimes feels like more just like a mere dream. God's plan for our lives feels like a dream. That God did not interfere or God does not intervene often when things go turn from bad to worse. That all of us want God. We pray, God, you know, intervene. Uh, take me out of this mess. Minister to my family. Uh, bring my son or my daughter back home. Uh, minister to my life. It's chaotic. I'm broke. I'm hurt. I'm infirmed. I'm sick. And a lot of times, most of the time, God chooses not to interfere. I could have used the word intervene or intervention, but God, a lot of times, He understands that He would just be taking away the opportunity for you to grow. That a lot of the tension, a lot of the mess that we've created or we've provoked is because we're lower based in our emotions. So we provoke a situation, our mouth, our pride gets us into trouble, our lack of patience or our personality, our temper, and then we want no consequences. We want no consequences. Quite the inverse. We want to be blessed. We want God to answer every prayer immediately when we want it, the way we want it, how we want it. And God is not a magician. God is not a, uh, a um, he is not in the business of just granting wishes. He listens to prayer, but he chooses when and how he answers prayer when it's to your benefit, when God is going to use that prayer for your benefit and for the benefit of others. My point is that most of us want God to intervene. Uh, and God says, nope, that would be interference. And because God knows that he's developing in us um, the different character of Christ that he wants us to have. At the end of the day, God allows everyone to be tested. Everyone will be tested. Every single one of us right now has a particular level that God is testing you. That until you pass that test, you don't go from first grade to fifth grade. You go from first to second and from second to third. That is the way our educational system, that is also the same tier system that God uses spiritually. That whenever we get stuck at a certain level and we keep repeating that over and over and you don't grow and you don't evolve, uh, Joseph, God calls him in, in Genesis chapter 49, or calls him a fertile vine. You are a fruitful vine. That when you were thrown into the pit, this is his father prophesying. When you were thrown into the pit, uh, you did not wait for somebody to throw you a lifeline. You did not cry foul. Uh, you did not say, this is not fair. He says, you grew like a fru fruitful vine, uh, like an ivy that sticks to the wall, and you climbed out of that pit. Uh, no lifeline. Uh, you didn't play the blame game. You did not uh, play the victim, but you grew out of your predicament. You grew, uh, you evolved, um, and so you were a fruitful vine. And that is, in essence, what God uses many times, the tests, the trials, even temptation, even struggles, even setbacks. God will allow them. Some of them we provoke. Some of them we cause them. Others God allows uh, the storms of life to come because God uses storms and trials to help us grow. Uh, this morning I want to just remind you that even while you're being tested, God is faithful. How many say amen? God is faithful. He will not suffer uh, you to be tempted, or the word there is tested, beyond that which you are able to bear. So God understands your limits. He understands what you're capable of handling, how much torque, how much pain, or how much um, heat you can take. But with every temptation, or with the temptation, or with every test or trial, he will also make a way of escape uh, that you may be able to bear it, that you may be able to hang in there. Look at what Jesus says to his own disciples in John 16. I have told you all of this that you may have peace. In me, so that when in the middle of the storm or the trial, God wants you to have deep abiding peace and not panic and not throw in the towel and not succumb and not lose your center of gravity, but have peace. Because here on earth, you will have many, you will have many trials and sorrows. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But he says, take heart because I have overcome the world. Uh, take heart because if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you are already automatically an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. So you should have peace and have that sense of center of gravity 
without panicking. I love this other uh, chapter 16, same, um, uh, it's not chapter 16, this is uh, James chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, Consider it pure joy, uh, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. So you should rejoice, you should be content, you should be thankful that God has found you worthy of being tested. Because you know that the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Other version says patience. It produces patience. And let this perseverance finish its work so that you may, watch this, so that you may mature, so that you may grow and you may mature um, and be complete and lacking anything so that you don't lack a thing. Uh, that's what God is doing in your life. So I want to talk this, this morning using the story of Joseph, the process toward relational health, relational health and maturity. Relational health and maturity. Emotional maturity. Some of us, God is blessed with a keen intellect. You're sharp, you're intelligent, but your um, em- emotional intelligence is, is very low. Your, your EI is very low, your emotional intelligence. And so this keeps undermining what God wants to do in your life because you have not evolved emotionally. Your social intelligence, you're, you're not able to get along with anybody because of your ego or your pride or your selfishness uh, or your temperament or your personality. So relationally, you are way, way down in the spectrum. Um, instead of growing socially, your social intelligence, your emotional intelligence, your your Uh, gifts that God has given you are are underdeveloped. All those giftings are underdeveloped because you have not grown and therefore your relationships suffer. Anger, bitterness, uh, reactions that are premature. You speak before you think. You get in trouble. Your pride, your pride gets in the way. And so I want to talk about this journey, this process of how Joseph recovered his relationships, especially with his brothers in this process. The first thing is that we want to, the first test, I want to call it the vision test uh, or the visual test. Uh, Can you sense or can you remember God's plan for your dreams or God's dreams, God's plans for your life through visioning, through seeing it? Because God will show you a picture when you're young, when you're growing up, when he called you into life, into a ministry, he showed you a ministry or he shows you a picture of the future. That's a vision. That's what he gave them. God gave them a dream uh, of, it was a picture. It was his brother's his sheaves the, of, of wheat and grain bowing to his sheaf that was standing erect and, and there was, they were paying homage. His brothers immediately got the connotation uh, and the meaning of that dream. And Joseph understood it as well. And then he has a second dream and this time it's a heavens. It's, connect, it's a dream connected to heaven that is connected to earth because that's what real dreams that come from God or a vision comes from heaven. But it takes place, it takes reality You have to harvest, you have to sow it, you have to cultivate it here on earth. You have to get busy, you have to find a job, you have to go to college, you have to find uh, that career. When God called me to the ministry, a Sunday morning like this, I just assumed that the next week or the next month I was going to be in ministry. I was a young man, very, very young. I did not want to be a minister, did not want to be called to ministry, but I just assumed. So I went to go, I told the pastor that God is calling me to the ministry he says, well, he says, are, are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm sure. How can I, what, what, what do I need to do? What can, what can I do to help? And so he says, Saul, if you're sure that God has called you to the ministry, um, what are you doing this Saturday? I said, I'm available. So he says, uh, around 8 o'clock, I'll see you here at church. I, you know, I dress fairly nice because I thought in my mind we're going to either spend some time in prayer. He's going to start mentoring me. We're going to go do some visits at the hospital. And when I showed up, he was a little surprised. And so he takes me to the tool shed of the church. And he takes out push brooms and a blower, a a, a blower. And he begins me to make me, I mean, ask me to, he he made me uh, (laughs) with no pay. Just began to sweep all around the perimeter of that, of the church. I'm not being facetious. And then after that, um, you know, to blow the, all the dust and the dirt of the parking lot. And I had no idea what I was doing. The wind was coming this way, and I was blowing it against the wind. I mean, I'm sweating. I'm sweating. By the time I'm done, I'm, I am filthy, filthy. And I am finally done. And he has the audacity to inspect my work. 
And then at the end of the day, I don't know, 2 or 3 o'clock that afternoon, he says, Saul, if you still feel God's calling, I'll see you here next Saturday. Next Saturday. <laughs> if you still feel that God has called you, I'll see you here next Saturday. And the Lord is my witness. I was there next Saturday. Because what I sensed from God was like overpowering. I just couldn't help it. And I understood. And this time I came prepared. <laughs> and that happened for months. And just part of the process. That was my first test. Do, do you believe in what God is showing you enough to hang in there when you're being tested? When, when the opposite happens. And we did not go to hospitals. We did not go into a mentoring ship. He did not go, you know, hey, here's your classes. Here's your Bible school. It was, hey, can you really, is this test real enough for you get to get your hands dirty? Can you wait? Can you hang in there? Can you be faithful? Can you come back and back and back, even when the evidence and when it feels total opposite to the vision, to the calling? And that's what happened to Joseph. He had a, a dream of being great, of being respected by his brothers. And the opposite, instead of being respected, his brothers take him. Uh, they, they put him in a pit. They, they, um, they beat him up, in essence, in essence, and then they sell him to Ishmaelites. They sell him. And so years later, Joseph goes through a process that some of this will be in this story here. But years later, I'm going to take you to where he's standing now. He's the governor. He's in charge of the world except for, for Pharaoh. And he's now in dispensing food because there's a famine on the earth because of the dreams that he interpreted for Pharaoh. Seven years of, of fruitfulness and um, vitality and abundance. And then seven years of famine would come that would ruin the whole world. And so in their, their first or the second year of famine, the Bible says, second year of famine, and now jo Jacob, his father, tells the ten brothers, go to Egypt. I hear there's grain. I hear there's food in Egypt. Go and get some food. Buy some food for us. If not, we'll starve and we'll die. That's what it says in the prior verses to this. And now Joseph was the governor of the land and the person who sold grain, and he was the person to, that sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived... They bow down to him with their faces to the ground. Hmm. I wonder where he saw that picture before. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And then he remembered his dreams about them. So the vision test is, can you identify the vision? Can you come to terms with the giftings, the passion, uh, those areas where God has placed a burden it could be with youth. It could be with, you know, to serve children. It could be to serve men or women or couples. It could be to serve with your gifts. You might be an engineer or somebody that has a trade gift or somebody who's been blessed with the ability to work. Um, God has, you know, put in your heart a desire to be effective, to be used. My point is that is your dream. That is God's purpose. That is God's vision. Can you keep that alive even when things go afoul, when things go south? And he remembered his dreams. Now he realizes that, that that experience about being thrown in the pit, being sold as a slave, being in Potiphar's house all those years, and overcoming the, and resisting temptation from Potiphar's wife. And then for that, he gets thrown into prison. And in prison, he was forgotten. He was forgotten in prison even after he interpreted uh, the cupbearer's dream, uh, dreams. And he says, hey, you're going to be restored when you get to Pharaoh. Remember me. And the Bible says that the cupbearer forgot him and he stayed two more years in prison. My point is, can you the, pass the vision test? Can you keep a hold? Uh, can you keep seeing that ministry unfold, that family grow, that marriage being healed? Can you see your children coming back um, as the God has promised? Or you can see it in your picture, that picture. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household shall be saved. Can you believe in God's word? Can you keep the dream alive? Joseph says, you are, you are spies. Uh, he's doing this, if you keep reading this chapter, through an interpreter. He says, you are spies. He had wisdom. Joseph had matured. He grew in 13 years. He became uh, bilingual. He spoke, spoke Hebrew and he spoke uh, perfect Egyptian language, whatever that language was. But he is speaking through an interpreter. And that interpreter is speaking in Hebrew. And he says, you are spies. You've come to see our land or spy the land because you're looking for vulnerabilities. You're looking for where it's unprotected. No, my Lord. No, my Lord, they call. They don't even know it's Joseph. 
They were calling him, my Lord. They answered, your servants have come to buy food and we are the sons of one man. And your servants are honest men, not spies. Do you guys see the irony right there? Your servants are honest men. So he's like, thinking, what? You're honest? I wouldn't be here if you were honest men. And yet that's the mystery. That's God's way. That's, that's how God works. And they're there and they say, your servants are honest men. I watch this. Your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now uh, with our father, and the, and the one is no more. The one is no more. Like, we don't know what happened to him. And that one is, is sitting right there, right in front of them. And they're beginning to just share. And Joseph begins to see how much they've grown. And the one... Like, we don't know his, their, his whereabouts. We don't, he just disappeared. They know that they sold him, but they don't know his whereabouts. And that's God. The second test is the faithfulness test. The faithfulness. The first test is the vision test. Can you continue to believe in God's dream and calling? And how do you know his dream is by his calling, his passion, the gifts that he's given you, what you're good at, what you long to do. The second is the faithfulness test, uh, the ability to resist and reject sin or the temptation. The ability to reject or resist um, and or reject sin, temptation, because we live in a fallen world and all of us live in a fallen state through a, a fallen, a fallen uh, life and a fallen nature. Um, Mother Teresa, Teresa said that God has not called me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. He's called you to be faithful. Can you pass the faithfulness test in the high times, the low tides, uh, the wrong times? Can you be faithful at all times to God? Now, Joseph was tempted when he was, uh, he was well-built and handsome. It reminds me of me. Of me. <laughs> well-built and handsome. Okay, never mind. I was going to dwell there, but let me move on. Uh, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. And that, it was ongoing. This was an ongoing, not a one-and-done temptation. Uh, no one is greater, he said to her, than I am in this household. My master, your husband, has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How can I then do such a wicked, such a wicked thing and sin against God? How can I do this? And, and uh, though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or enter in a, an adulterous relationships, uh, even uh, to be with her, even to be with her. Most of you know the story. She found a day where no one was there. She sent all the servants out. It was just Joseph that was doing uh, his bidding, his business. She corrals them, seduces him, um, over, tries to overpower him. Something went on there that want, probably crossed lines. How do we know that? That the Bible says that when he finally was able to say no to her and reject the moment of temptation, any man, any man, any young man here, listen, I don't care your age, your stage, your intelligence, your education, or the lack thereof. Uh, when you're in a predicament where you're there by yourself, in front of a television, or in front of a device, in front of your, your iPad, or your iPhone, or your phone, your, your smartphone, you dummy, I mean your smartphone, um, when you're there with a, a person of the opposite sex, young man or young lady, whoever you are, and there's temptation there, uh, you, you need to be a real man. You need to have the fear of God. You need to be able to, to say as a woman of God, nope, um, what, what, did they, what happened here? They started texting. Uh, Potiphar's wife started texting to Joseph. Hey, cutie. Hey, handsome. Okay, you're not with me. And he said, I am, ain't I? Et cetera, et cetera. Hey, you're not that bad looking yourself. And it just starts, the, the, the look, the stare, the look, the connection. And all of a sudden it starts evoking, evoking something improper, young man, young lady, a sister, married husband, married wife. All of a sudden somebody begins to place, like pay attention to you. Uh, you begin to feel different. You begin to feel uh, valued, valued by somebody at work. A co-worker begins to pay attention. 
uh, begins to, to pay compliments and you, like, you're starving for, uh, for affirmation. Young man or young lady, sister, you're starving for affirmation. Finally, somebody sees beauty in you. Somebody sees value in you. Somebody sees you uh, as an asset, as, a, as an equal. Because when you get home, it's not there, men or sisters. When, when your home environment is, is void, devoid of substance and of affirmation and of relationships that are healthy, your children will look for it elsewhere. Your wife will try and get it somewhere else or your husband, sister, will, will try to get it somewhere else because at home it is chaotic, it is dysfunctional, there is tension, uh, there is a war, there is yelling, there is screaming. Uh, something is not right, something is ill at home. And so he, something was going on there because the Bible says that when he finally was able to run out of there, he ran out of there without his shirt and pants. Okay, I'll leave it right there. Uh, I'll leave it right there. My point is that uh, the faithfulness test will have you reject. You have to reject the, the enemy's sinister and seductive alternatives. Uh, the enemy will tell you, yes, you can. Um, you know, God will forgive you. And you'll head in a direction where it's seduction and it's sinister, the plans or the, the temptation that the enemy has for you. Uh, you, are, you and I are called to resist the temptation, to give up uh, the, the temptation also to give up prematurely or the tendency, the tendency to get bitter uh, after experiencing heartbreaking and devastating disappointments, uh, brother and sisters and, and uh, friends. Uh, if, if you don't give up, some of us get bitter. And that will lead you to, um, to a path of destruction uh, in your own heart and your own mind. The number th three test, the test of responding by faith, the, the test uh, of, of, of trust. It's a trust test. Can you live by faith and not by sight? Can you pass this trust test uh, that God has for you? I'd like for you to remember this formula, that obedience plus submission equals God's favor. That obedience uh, plus submission is, is like trusting God. And if you trust God, you will receive God's favor. You will enjoy God's favor, God's blessings uh, to your life. And so the Bible says that he was thrown into prison because he resisted temptation. And there in prison, um, you know, his, he begins to see God's favor or sense God's favor there in prison. And um, and so while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And so he interprets the dreams of, uh, of the cupbearer. And he says, when all goes well and the dream that I've interpreted for you becomes uh, reality, I want you to remember me and show me kindness. Mention my name. Just, just, just drop my name to Pharaoh and to get me out of prison because I was forcibly, forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing that deserves to deserve being put in a dungeon. So this was not a, a prison, open air, is a, a dungeon, underground dungeon prison. And he says, I've done nothing to deserve being here. So when you, when your dream comes to fruition, the, that I've interpreted for you, Joseph says to the cupbearer, when you get be before Pharaoh, remember me. And the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. And he forgot him. And that's where a lot of us are in life. You feel like God's forgotten you. Uh, you're forgotten in, in a relationships. You're somebody else's forgotten dream or you're somebody else's forgotten piece of the puzzle. You've been forgotten. Number four test is the patience test. Patience. That most of us, a lot of us fail this test because we get impatient. We get premature. Uh, we, we react prematurely or precipitously and then you ruin it. You, you intervene, um, you say things, you stop coming to church, you stop trusting God, you stop being faithful, you stop serving God in the areas of being patient. It's interesting that the Bible says when two years had passed, 
So there's Joseph still in prison for two more years. Uh, two years had passed. Uh, and then God gave Pharaoh a dream. So this is all God's timing. This is all God's timing in terms of being patient. Do you remember or the, the story of Noah? So being patient. Patience is the willingness to wait without losing your nerve or you're losing your peace, without complaining, while trusting God's character and the ability uh, for God to fulfill His Word. It's, it's waiting without complaining, without losing your nerve, without becoming negative. Uh, Noah waited patiently. As a matter of fact, he spent almost 100 years building the, the ark. 100 years building the ark. Talk about patience. Job lost everything and pretty much everyone that mattered to him. His comeback required trust, tenacity, and patience. Patience. Abraham and Sarah received a promise that they would have their own children. 25 years, they're still waiting. Patience. Moses was called by God to be a leader of God's people. And he spends 40 years, 40 years, God is developing him. 40 years in the desert, uh, taking care of somebody else's sheep. Patience. David was anointed king. 17 years later, he's still running for his life in caves and in the desert. Patience. Paul is called to be an apostle from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. 13, 14 years later, he's still developing. He's still not in the apostleship. He's still in development. Patience. And Joseph, our hero, his trek, his trials, his travails would become the stepping stones. Each one uh, from being rejected by his family and his brothers, by being put in a pit of despair, by being placed in Potiphar's house of slavery and drudgery over and over. He's not earning a salary. He's a slave. He's been bought and paid for. He's not uh, somebody who's important. He's somebody important to Potiphar, but he's a slave. And there he, he undergoes the test of being faithful. Can he be faithful even? Can he say no to this world? Can he say no to his flesh? Can he say no to the wrong relationships? And for that, he gets thrown in prison there he in prison, God is still working. He, every step that looked like it was a step downward was really a promotion. Every, pass, every test that he passed was God developing and preparing him. Uh, he had to wait the patience test. Uh, Proverbs 16, 32 says, better is a patient person. A patient person is better than a warrior, than somebody who's strong, than, than a strong person. A one, uh, the one with self-control is stronger than the one who takes a city by force. Uh, Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart. And says, and wait for the Lord. Twice is wait for the Lord. You wait for the Lord. And while you're waiting, you're strong, and you take heart. You, you take heart. You don't give up. Second Peter says, but do not overlook one fact, beloved. That the, for the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is his one day. Watch the next verse. And the Lord really, uh, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promises in answering and fulfilling your dreams and answering your prayers. I know you're desperate, but God is not. He is not slow. He's not forgotten. Uh, his promises, like some people think, no, he's being patient for your sake. That God is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, uh, but wants everyone to repent. And sometimes trouble and travail lead us to repenting, uh, to repentance. Um, the last test here is the test of forgiveness. Uh, the test of forgiveness. Um, the test of forgiveness. The forgiveness test. And that's for you to forgive and to release all those people that have done you wrong. Everyone that owes you a debt, can you let them go? Can you forgive them? Uh, people that meet me, a lot of us say, yes, they're forgiven, but you don't meet with them or you don't call them and you don't restore that relationship or you don't at least let them know everything's okay. Now, I'm not talking about you have to be buddy buddies. I don't talk about, it doesn't mean that you walk with them in fellowship, somebody who hurt you, somebody who's not changed, somebody who's still depraved, uh, somebody who's still uh, not able to, to respond correctly. But there's got to be a point where you let them go. You release them. You make that phone call. You let them know that all is good. All is forgotten. Everything's behind you. Because that's the point of departure. That is where you pass the forgiveness test. That, that, 
that God wanted Joseph to pass. Because he's there, and if you look at the story, he's, he's putting them, working them. He's making them go through uh, different uh, trials. He's putting them through the ringer. Like, read the story. They come the first time. He keeps Simeon. He sends the ones back. Now, in this process, he's forgiving them. Watch the way he does it. He, he, he fills their, their sacks with grain. And in the process, he tells his steward, put their money back in, their, in their, their money bags. Put it back in the bags or the sacks of grain. And they discover that the money is there, minus Simeon. He keeps Simeon as collateral. You guys go back to the father. They have this relationship, this conversation. Is the father doing well? Is your, you, you've got a younger brother. Next time, you will not see my face. Until you bring your brother, I want to make sure that what you're telling me is the truth. And the father is going through agony. The father doesn't want to lose Benjamin like he lost Joseph. And there's the brothers, the reaction. If you read the story, you'll say Reuben. You'll see Reuben, the older brother, just totally maturing. He says, I told you guys. Like, their, their conscience is grieving them. I told you guys we shouldn't have done that to the lad, to the boy. Um, Judah, it was Judah that thought, like, let's sell him. Instead of killing him, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. And now it is Judah who's advocating with Jacob saying, Dad, let me take Benjamin and my life for his life. You've got my kids. If something happens to Benjamin, you've got my children or your children. Um, and just let me take the boy with me. And I will, I will put my life for his life. Like watch the, the ringer. Watch the process. And Joseph is struggling. He sends them back. They come. And this time they bring Joseph. They bring Benjamin. Uh, he let Simeon, the second oldest brother, out of prison. And they're there. And Joseph uh, is, is hearing their, them talk in Hebrew. They don't realize he understands every single word. And it says, I told you guys. I told you we shouldn't have done that. It is God. It is our sins that are now catching up. It is our sins that are catching up to us. And when Joseph was hearing it, he couldn't. Several times he would go and he would weep by himself and then come out. And then he tells his steward, um, we're, I'm going to have lunch with them in my house. I'm going to have lunch with them. Take them, bring them to my house. And there in that house, he gives everybody food and he gives Benjamin five times the portion. And it's an incredible story, an incredible story. And then he has everyone leave the house. And right there, he tells his brothers, it is I, it is Joseph, your brother. They can't believe it. They're besides themselves. Uh, because several times there are pain obedience and homage the forgiveness test so he turned away from them and began to weep and then he came back and spoke to them again and he had Simeon return to them and you know and and the first time yeah the first time he took Simeon and bound Simeon um, and then Joseph gives orders for their here's forgiveness I'm going to give you back what is yours I'm not going to hold it I'm going to give it back to you and Judah went up and said to him, Pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak just this one word. He's, oh, let me, let me finish this because this is important. Worship team, come, help me. This is important. So they're back. He puts not only their money back, but he takes his silver cup, his cup, and he puts it in Benjamin's uh, bag of grain. The money back, double the portion, and he puts his cup and the steward chases after them because they've left the palace. They're going back with food. Um, Joseph hasn't revealed himself yet. He hasn't revealed himself. And so they're on their way back and he says, hey, one of you guys stole my master's silver cup. And they said, nope, none of us. And they start from the oldest. Oh, when they were in Joseph's house. Oh, there's a story so rich. I'm sorry. That Joseph sits them all from the oldest one to the youngest one. And they're thinking, how does he know? Like he starts with Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Gad uh, and Dan and Nephtali and Asher and Issachar. I'm trying to remember one or two more that uh, neither, you guys don't even know. What, why am I asking you guys? Thank you. But he sits them all in order from the, young, or the oldest to the youngest. And so he puts the, the silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And so when they gets there, the steward knows the order. And he begins with Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah. No. And then they say, whoever, whoever, 
whoever's bag that cup is, they were just like so fearful. Let them die or let them forever become your slave. That's what they said. And so when they get to, they get to Benjamin's sack of grain and they opened. You know what the Bible says? They all rent their clothes. They all began to weep for their little brother. I mean, before they didn't, they didn't have that kind of nature. I mean, God is working on everybody. God is working on people that maybe in your past were like nefarious. They were, they were like just, they hurt you. You never know what God is doing behind the scenes with everybody because God loves everyone the way he loves you. And the person that hurt you, God loves them too because hurt people hurt people. And, and sometimes it would benefit us to put, us in, put ourselves in their shoes. They open up the sack and there's the, there's the, the cup of silver. And they rent their clothes and they come back. The, the steward says, you guys can leave. Benjamin's coming back. They all come back with Benjamin. And they start pleading with Joseph. And Joseph has to cry by himself. Come back. And then Judah says, pardon. Pardon me. Um, just one word. Let me, let me give you one word, he says to him. Um, if it pleases you. He's talking to Joseph. Let your servant remain here as for my Lord's slave. I will be his, your slave in place of the boy. This is Joseph testing, test, test, test. Can you pass the test? And let the boy return with his brothers, Judah. For if you forgive, um, so, that, that's, so Jesus says, for if you forgive other people's sins against you, your heavenly father will forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive uh, their sins, your, your father will not forgive your sins. And then it comes to the point where, where Joseph can see that there are changed people. There, there are changed brothers. And he says, come close to me. He said to them, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold to, into Egypt. And he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. Do you know when you read this story, see if you can find all the seven times that Joseph wept. That would be like just highlight seven times that Joseph wept. It's powerful. Uh, he, he Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And watch this. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And afterwards, he talked, his brothers talked with him. They start fellowshipping. And the bottom line is that um, as for you, at the end of the story, they were afraid his father had died and he says hey forgive us and he says hey whatever you meant for evil you meant evil against me but God meant it for good and to bring about that many people would be kept alive and that as they are today the message Bible says don't you see you planned evil against me but God used it used those same plans for my good, for my good. And as you see all around you right now, life-saving plans for many, many people. My point, I guess, is the essence of this message is whatever travails, whatever trouble, whatever trials or tribulation you are going through, do not underestimate their importance. God is working it for your good. Do not underestimate the importance of passing every test, especially the faithfulness test. Be faithful, be faithful, even when things go wrong. Be patient. Be patient, be patient, be patient, even when you're running out of patience and things are not happening. And please, by all means, pass the forgiveness test. Whoever's hurt you in life, you let them go. You release them. You bless them. You bless them because if you're able to pass those tests, God has crowning blessings for you. How many say amen this morning? Let's give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you... Uh, bow your heads with me. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? For those of you online, thank you guys for being with us. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your blessings and your contributions. Thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you here next Sunday. Um, and just spread the word in Jesus' name. As your heads are bowed with me, for those of you, this is the most important part for many of you. If your life is not right with God and you 
I'm so glad you were able to join us and I pray, I really do sincerely that God was able to minister, that something broke, that something opened, that you were able to see beyond the pale, the today, and be able to gaze the horizon of what God is still doing and wants to do in your life. Thank you for being part of this family, part of this movement. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving. It's it really, it's make a difference. It's helping this church move forward uh, with our mission and our call to lead thousands of people to know God, grow together and go serve. Uh, God has called this church to win the lost, to reach the lost, to retain the next generation, to disciple the believer, to equip and empower the emerging leaders and then to plant churches, to multiply, multiply, multiply. And you can be part of this movement. We're thankful for you, thankful for your prayers. Thank you for your gifts and then communicate, share this message. Join us, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and be part of just communicating and be a herald, be an evangelist, be somebody that communicates light uh, through the different uh, social media platforms. And then thank you for your faithfulness. It means a lot, especially to God and this church, and we love you, and we're looking forward to seeing you soon.